Today's scripture is found in Job 27. And Job again took up his discourse, and he said, As God lives, who has taken away my right? And the Almighty, who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips will not speak falsehood and my tongue will not utter deceit. Far be it from me to say that you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. Let my enemy be as the wicked, and let him who rises up against me be as the unrighteous. For what is the hope of the godless when God cuts him off, when God takes away his life? Will God hear his cry when distress comes upon him? Will he take delight in the Almighty? Will he call upon God at all times? I will teach you concerning the hand of God. What is with the Almighty I will not conceal. Behold, all of you have seen it yourselves. Why then have you become altogether vain? This is the portion of a wicked man with God and the heritage that oppressors receive from the Almighty. If his children are multiplied, it is for the sword, and his descendants have not enough bread. Those who survive him, the pestilence buries, and his widows do not weep. Though he heap up silver like dust and pile up clothing like clay, he may pile it up, but the righteous will wear it and the innocent will divide the silver. He builds his house like a moth, like a booth that a watchman makes. He goes to bed rich, but will do so no more. He opens his eyes and his wealth is gone. Terrors overtake him like a flood, and the night a whirlwind carries him off. The east wind lifts him up and he is gone. It sweeps him out of his place. It hurls him without pity. He flees from its power in headlong flight. It claps its hands at him, and he hisses at them from its place. This is God's word. You may be seated. All right, well, grab your Bibles, uh, and let's uh, please open a Bible app or whatever. We're going to walk through this together. Uh, a lot of you know in uh, the, 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 the old um, Disney movie from 1940, Pinocchio, it's one of those classics now. Uh, you know sort of the contours of the story most likely. There's a man named Geppetto, and Geppetto doesn't have any children, and he so desperately wants to have a son. And so he sits down and fashions a puppet out of, out of uh, you know, a, a little boy puppet out of wood and, and falls asleep one night hoping that it's going to come to life. And a blue fairy shows up in the night and, and, uh, and actually animates Pinocchio and, and, and gives him life and, and then gives him a little uh, cricket, right, called Jiminy Cricket that goes along with him and sort of shows him through life. And before the blue fairy departs, she says, now remember Pinocchio. Um, to be a good boy and to always let conscience be your guide, which turns out to be such a catchy phrase that they turn into a song, right? Always let your conscience, right? So they, they, <laughs> they, they sing, they break out in song, and it's this one, one memorable uh, song from, from Pinocchio. Now, don't answer the question, hold this in for a second. Is that good advice? Always let your conscience be your guide. Job 27 through 31 is basically Job's last stand, okay? He is going to go through this long monologue now where he's going to make his final defense. Uh, You will not hear from Job when chapter 31 ends. You're not going to hear from Job except for these brief little interludes in chapter 40 and the last chapter, chapter 42. But after pretty much chapter 31, he goes silent. And you're going to hear other people talking, including God. But Job 27 is Job appealing to conscience, him saying, there are things that you've been saying about me, and I'm going to appeal to my conscience as one last defense of what I am and who you say I am versus what I know that I am. And that's what I want to look at today. I want to sort of briefly unpack chapter 27, and because Job introduces this issue of your conscience, I actually want to talk to you about 
uh, your conscience in light of uh, chapter 27 today, okay? Now, so what, what have we heard? We've, we've listened to these guys now for 26, well, 23 chapters, basis back and forth between Job and his friends, and they're essentially saying, Job, you're obviously wicked, really terrible wicked things don't happen, uh, bad things don't happen unless you're horribly wicked, Job. So obviously, there's some hidden sin in your life, and, and, uh, and, and God is revealing that through kind of the circumstances that have come upon you, okay? Job has vehemently disagreed all along, and he's going to continue doing that today. Okay, so, so watch how he does it today, and what we're going to do is I want to start at the end and work our way to the top. We're going to start, actually, this, this, this passage divides into two parts. It goes uh, verses 1 through 6 and verses 7 through 23. Well, I'm going to start at the 7 through 23 part, and then, in fact, we're going to break that down into two parts and, uh, and make our way all the way back up to, to the main, really, I think, uh, issue in chapter 27. Okay, so, so what's happening? Job's going to start in verses 7 through 23, and he's essentially, here's the big idea. He's going to say to these friends, you, you can't be right about me, okay? What you've been saying just cannot be right. And here's his defense in verses 7 to 23. In verse, in verse 13 to 23, I told you we're going to start at the end, we'll move up. In verses 13 to 23, Job's going to basically say this, do wicked people believe what I believe? Okay, notice what he does in verse 13. He says, this is the portion of a wicked man with God and the heritage that oppressors receive from the Almighty. Okay, so, so uh, what are wicked people? Let's just really briefly review class. Wicked people are not just terrorists and adulterers and murderers and that kind of thing. No, wickedness in Scripture are people, the Bible's also going to call them fools, who say, there is no God, or I live my life without reference to God. God means nothing to me. Okay, that's wickedness in Scripture. And so Job is going to say, look, here's the portion of the wicked. Let me, let me explain to you. In fact, I'm going to even repeat some of your words back to you. I believe this stuff, Job says, and you think I'm wicked. So he's going to say, look, he's going to, he's going to look and say, essentially in verses, uh, in verses 13 to 23, uh, I believe someday wicked will receive justice. There will be a, a, a reckoning that happens with the holy God. They will be punished for their sins. And he goes through and says, this is what their punishment is going to look like. He says their prosperity is not going to last. It's going to be here one day and gone the next, right? They're going to wake up and it's gone. They're, they're, they're putting their trust in their riches and all that stuff's going to melt away, right? They, 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 are, they are thinking that their house is secure and their house is no better. I think he says in verse 19, it's no better than, or verse 18, than, than the house of a moth, a cocoon, right? It's, it's something that is so temporal. And he's saying, this is what the riches of the wicked are like. They are here today. They're gone tomorrow. Now, by the way, this echoes what scripture says. Proverbs chapter 23 says, do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it's gone for suddenly it sprouts wings flying away like an eagle toward heaven, right? You, you put your trust in it and suddenly you find it's gone. That is not something we want to be trusting in. Paul in the New Testament is going to say to his young protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, Timothy, charge the rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Timothy, as a pastor, he's going to say, Chris, as a pastor, anybody who stands up here needs at times to warn the rich of this present age. It's interesting he says that way. If you're a follower of Jesus, right, and someday we find ourselves in a heavenly kingdom, we will all be unbelievably wealthy and unbelievably prosperous and unbelievably healthy, but not in this life. So he says, charge them in this life not to be haughty, right? I'm supposed to stand up here and charge you and say, don't be haughty. Riches are one of those things that make us feel better than other people. I must be a better person. Okay, Job's saying, I don't believe that. I think that someday they're going to sprout wings, they're going to fly away. This is how I believe. And guys, if I believe this about wicked people, why would I hang on to my wickedness knowing this is what's to come for me, the wicked person that you say that I am? See what he's doing? He's saying, look, you can't be right about me because a wicked person wouldn't believe what I believe. That's the first thing. The second thing he says is you can't be right about me because he says, do wicked people do what I'm doing? And I think the key verse here is verse 10. 
Okay, look at, look at chapter 27, verse 10. He says, will he, that's wicked, take delight in the Almighty? Will he call upon God at all times? Okay, what's he doing there? He's saying, this is so, this is like an oxymoron, a wicked person. Again, somebody who doesn't, has no reference and no understanding, doesn't want anything to do with God, calling upon God and delighting in God. Well, those, don't, those two things don't go together. That's what Job is saying. You, you, you say this, and yet, guys, look at my life. I have delighted in God. You think you're teaching me something. Job, repent. Obviously, there's some hidden sin. And look at verse 19. He says, I'm actually the one teaching you. Um, he, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. He says in, in, uh, in verse 11, he says, I will teach you concerning the hand of God. What is the Almighty? What, what is with the Almighty? I will not conceal. He says, I'm the one. You guys are learning something about how God works in this world by looking at me. I am a living illustration of some mystery that none of us knew before this, that somehow God, in fact, there is righteous suffering, that suffering comes to those who are innocent. I don't know if you remember way back when, in the beginning of this book, I quoted you a guy named Christopher Ash, where he said, the book of Job is not so much about suffering as it is about how God treats his friends. That's... That's amazing insight, that in fact, what if this is the way God treats his friends because he's certainly going to treat Jesus this way, right? This, fellas, friends, Job would say, this is how God works in the world. It's been a mystery to us up to this point, but now we're seeing it, right? So do wicked people do what I'm doing? They don't believe what I believe. They don't do what I do. They don't trust in God. They haven't said, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to walk with God all my days. Guys, you've seen me since you got here. In fact, look back on my life. This is part of what the writer of Job wants to do. He wants us to look back in, verses, in chapters 1 and 2 and go, look at this man. He has served God faithfully again and again and again. And Job's going to say, I'm still serving God faithfully. So that's the first thing. Second thing, so uh, you can't be right about me. Now Job is going to say in verses 1 through 6, I cannot agree with you. I can't possibly agree with you. So go to, go to verse 3 with me. Okay, we're making our way up the ladder. And here we go. He says this, as long, just watch this, as long as my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, okay, shorthand, as long as I'm alive, A, God's spirit is in, I'm, I'm going to keep serving God, I'm going to keep walking with God, but this is just saying, as long as I have breath in my body, verse 4, my lips will not speak falsehood and my tongue will not utter deceit. Now, that's a, that's a great goal for all of us to have, right? That we would not be liars, we would not deceive people. We would not say what is wrong. We would not agree with, with wrongdoing. We wouldn't say the truth is false and, the, and what's false is true. And most of us think about that in terms of like blatant, uh, you know, lies that I might tell. Uh, you know, I cheated on an exam or, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm, I'm fudging my wealth or something, you know, something like this. But look at how Job applies this. I'm not going to speak falsely about what, Job? Look at verse 5. Far be it from me to say that you're right. Till I die, I will not have put away my integrity from me. You know what you say I'm not going to lie about? I'm not going to lie by agreeing with you guys about who you say that I am. I'm not going to go where you take me, right? In fact, look at verse 6. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. Job says, I can look back and in all honesty, I can, of course he's sinned in the past. Job is not saying he's blameless. He's not saying in the sense that he has sinlessness. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying there is no hidden sin. I am not walking around in unrepentant, harboring my sin. I can't look in my past and see anything all the way up to the present. There is nothing. So what he's saying is, guys, if I agree with you, I violate my integrity. If I say yes to what you want me to say yes to you, I have to lie. I have to deceive. I have to go against my conscience. Christian, do you know it is no small thing? It is no small thing to go against a biblically informed conscience. 
That is not something that we trifle with. Some of you know the story um, of, of Martin Luther, at least some of the contours, right? On October 31st, 1517, he famously nails the 95 theses to the Wittenberg door, or the door of the chapel in, in Wittenberg, Germany. And that, of course, sets off a firestorm. Right? This is a, Europe is governed. It's, it's really part of this extended empire, and Europe is, is, is governed by Roman Catholicism, right? So there's a pope, and there's, you know, there's, there's, there's all these, these chiefs that oversee this, and it creates this massive controversy within Christendom, right? So we have this schism between the Roman Catholic Church and Protestants, and all this stuff starts stirring up in 1517, and people are talking about it all around the empire. To the point that they, they convene, the, the Emperor Charles V convenes what's called the Diet of Worms. That's just spelled worms. It doesn't mean he's eating worms. It means this is a council. The Diet of Worms is a council where they call together the leading, the, the, the greatest leaders of the day. And they come together. And the whole point of this council is that Martin Luther will have a chance to recant what he said. So on April 17th, 1521, so we're not quite four years into this great reformation when he, when he nailed the, the, the 95 Thesis. On April 17th, Martin Luther, under police escort essentially, because there had been death threats on his life and people that wanted to assassinate him for what he had written about the Bible. This seems so foreign to us in our modern time, right? But this is going on in Europe at the time. And so they, he comes under police escort to Worms, Germany. He walks in and in the gallery, there are the the, 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 the most powerful people in the world are standing before him and, and are bringing this pressure to bear on Martin. You must recant. You are fracturing Christianity right now. And so they bring him up and they stand him. Here's a lone man, a lone, small, balding man in front of all these powerful people. And they bring out and they put his books in front of him that he'd written since then, and ask him, are these your books? And he says, yes. And they say, do you recant? And some of you think you know the end of the story here. And apparently Martin Luther murmurs something inaudible, and they say, speak up, Martin. And he raises his head. Hollywood would have you believe you know, there was never any problem, and he raised his fist, and like, I'm going to tell you, and here we go, right? Martin Luther raises his head and says, can I have 24 hours to think about it? And they take him away to his lodging, and you can read it. Don't Google it right now. He, he prays one of the most heartfelt, amazing prayers you will ever read in your life. And he just pours his heart out to God. God, this is your cause, and I'm, I know I'm your man. Please, please strengthen me. Please give me courage. There is, there is, he actually quotes a line from his own, from his own, uh, uh, a mighty fortress. The world is filled with devils that want to take me down. God, please, I am one man against the army. And the next day, on April 18, 1517, they bring him back. They stand him before the council. They put his books in front of him. Are these yours? Yes. Do you recount? And that's when Luther says the famous words. Now, listen to these carefully. I don't think he screams these out. I think he says these in a quiet tone. He is scared to death. He's trembling as he says this. Unless I am convinced by sacred scripture or by evident reason, I cannot recant. For my conscience is held captive by the word of God, and to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. You hear what he says? Look, leave that there for a second. Like if you write this down, you've got this in your notes, underline the words 
convinced by sacred scripture or evident reason. And then underline the words, to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. This is what he's saying. I can't violate my conscience. This is what Job is saying. I cannot agree with you. You want me to recant, and I can't do that, and it would be wicked. So I want to talk to you this morning about your conscience. Job has introduced this, and so I want to just take the rest of our time to really talk about this. And, and by the way, um, uh, I want to, I want to uh, least lead you to a book. If what I'm talking about this morning, you go, man, I'd, I'd love to read up more about this. Andy Nacelli and J.D. Crowley have written a wonderful book about the conscience. Here it is right here. Just to take a picture of it if you want. Order it on Amazon. It's a great little book. Uh, what it is how to train it, and loving those who differ. So they're going to cover a lot of stuff in this book that I'm not going to cover this morning. But I want to, I want to at least kind of double-click on this idea of, of, not, of not going against our conscience. Is it true that we must always let our conscience be our guide? Because Job is here following his conscience. So, so how are we to conceive of this, all right? So Let's talk about our conscience for a minute. First of all, what is it? What is a conscience? Um, is, it, is it a voice in your head? Is, you know, we have these sort of popular conceptions of it's an angel on this shoulder and a devil on this shoulder and the angel represents your conscience and the devil represents, you know, the temptation and you're supposed to listen to the angel and ignore the devil. Is that what's going on? Is that what your conscience is? What exactly is your conscience? Okay, well, let me give you a few things to think about relative to your conscience. Number one, your conscience is a distinctly human capacity, okay? Only humans have a conscience. I know 90% of you are going to hate me. Your dog does not have a conscience. I know, he puts his head down crumples, and I'm so sorry, you know, whatever. I say, I speak in the wrong tone to my dog, Ruby, and she'll just go into the bed, right? Does that mean she's got a conscience? Does she think about things like pride and selfishness and stealing, and I probably, I probably shouldn't eat that bird? I, I don't you know. No, like, like she's, she's got none of these things are rolling around in her head. We've got a cat, Milo. Milo has no conscience, but you know that already, right? <laughs> Cats don't have consciences. Whales are not concerned about what's happening in the rest of the world. There's no conscience in it. It is a distinctly human capacity. That's the first thing for you to know. The second thing for you to know is that your conscience is a mark of God's image on your life, right? We believe in something called the Imago Dei, right? That is, that's a fancy way of saying God has stamped his image on every single human being. You don't have to believe in God for his image to be in you. You could be an atheist, you could be a Buddhist, you could be, you could be a Christian, a Catholic, it doesn't matter. Every human being in the world bears the image of God, and one of the ways we bear the image of God is that we all have a conscience. We all, everyone, has an intuition between right and wrong. And if you don't, you are what psychologists would call a sociopath to one degree or another, right? So, so everybody is stamped with this thing called the image of God. We serve a moral God who has an, enacted moral things. And so we all know this, and I think we all know it intuitively. And by the way, this is exactly how your Bible is going to talk. Romans chapter 1, what can be known about God is plain to them. Talk about all humanity. For God has revealed it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. He's going to want to say, so they're without excuse. Nobody will stand before God and say, I didn't believe and I didn't know. That, that's just not even a fact. You can look out 
at the power of God in nature and the organization, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and things that have been made. Then Paul goes on in Romans chapter 2 and says, he, he talks about, okay, l- let's talk about conscience now. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, he's going to compare Jews and Gentiles here, by nature do what the law requires, they're a lot of themselves, even though they do not have the law. They don't have an Old Testament. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their consciences also bear witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of hearts by Christ Jesus. You hear what he just said? Everybody is going, I'm excusing some things, I'm accusing, there's something going on. In other words, C.S. Lewis and other philosophers called this the natural law. Every human being knows there are rules in this life that I must not transgress. There are things that I, I must not do, there's things that I must do, and we all know them. They're written on our hearts. Our conflicting thoughts excuse and accuse us. Paul says this is, this is exactly what's happening, right? We've got this intuition. We know there's rules we must obey, okay? Your, your, your conscience is a distinctly human capacity. Your conscience is a mark of God's image. But number three, your conscience is a gift. Do you know that? What a gift it is. What a gift your conscience is to your family. How many of us would just race past anything, nuke our families, forget about if I had no conscience? It's a gift to the society you live in. It's a gift to you. It's a gift to keep you from running off cliffs. It's a gift to help you not know the damage and pain from really terrible decisions. That is a gift that God gives to all humanity. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, right? He causes all these things. This is a common grace gift to everybody here. Everybody in the world has some measure of conscience in their life. But then that leads to the fourth thing. No one has a conscience perfectly aligned with God. No one. Apostle Paul didn't. Now, I'm saying what's in Scripture is infallible. I'm saying Paul in his personal life did not have, he was a human being. He's not Jesus, right? Jesus is the only human being who had a conscience perfectly aligned with God. You and I don't. No one you've ever known had a perfectly aligned conscience. So, blue fairy, (laughs) when you say to Pinocchio, always let your conscience be your guide. Is she right? No, no. But never let your conscience be your guide? No. So we should rewrite the song. So sometimes let your conscience be your guide. Something like that. Right? <laughs> okay, we're not perfectly aligned. So what this leads to then is this. We, we must have our consciences trained, calibrated, cultivated, whatever metaphor helps you there. By the word of God, right? That, that our conscience must be cultivated. And when they're not, we go off into all kinds of crazy directions. I just, for any of you who are interested, there's a new book coming out April 6th called, 2nd called Sociopath, a Memoir. It's written by a woman by the name of Patrice Gagne. And there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about it this week that said she basically grew up and looks back and says, I, I felt no empathy. I, I felt no sympathy. I, I, I didn't feel bad when I would steal things. I just did this, right? She had an untrained, uncultivated, uncalibrated conscience, okay? And what God is going to call us to do, especially you, Christian, is that we are expected to gradually adjust, train, calibrate our conscience to an objective standard, right? That's what calibration is. If I, if I calibrate a compass, I'm not just saying, oh yeah, I like where it's turned. I want to I make sure that needle, where it is supposed to point to true north, now I, now I can get around in the world. 
Michelle bakes, you know, sourdough loaves. And, and before she does that, she brings out a scale. And every time you recalibrate that scale to zero, if you put something on top of it, that then you're going to fill with something, you recalibrate it based on that. You always get it back to that spot so that you have an accurate measurement. This is what God calls us to do, Christian. I am supposed to calibrate my conscience based on the word of God. I line it up. I cultivate it with scripture. I must be convinced by sacred scripture or evident reason. Otherwise, I do not violate my conscience. That's really the general rule right there. You never obey a conscience, disobey a conscience that has been calibrated to what's true in scripture. That ought to be your general rule, right? Now, so much we can say. Really would refer you to this book. It's a great book. But I really want to talk about really one component of your conscience that I think is what gets flushed out here in the book of Job. And it's the issue of a conscience that condemns you unjustly. So please hear me. I am not talking about, you know what? Um, I slept with my girlfriend last night and I feel convicted and you're going to tell me I shouldn't feel convicted. No, you should. Okay, or I, 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 you know, I yelled at my children, or I yelled, you know, whatever, I lost my temper. You should feel conviction, okay? I, 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 want, I want you to hear that. But I want to talk about when our, when our consciences unjustly condemn us, because we all deal with one degree or another with some kind of guilty condemnation. And that's, that's a really key thing that I think we have, as Christians have to work through. What do we do? when our conscience condemns us. John MacArthur said years ago, and I think this is really helpful, he says, the conscience may be the most underappreciated and least understood attribute of humanity. Psychology is usually less concerned with understanding conscience than with attempting to silence it. Okay? Christian, our goal is not to silence conscience. It's a gift, remember this, it's a gift. It's the mark of the image of God. But much of modern psychology, and I'm not trying to throw anybody in the bus who's in, in, the, in that field. I'm simply saying there's a lot of it out there that is based on self-esteem and, and not thinking negatively about yourself, of devising ways to silence and soothe your conscience and not feel bad and ignore it. And I just have to say this, that cannot be the right response. And here's why. We believe there is a perfect holy God who governs over the universe and calls us to himself and then says to us, be holy as I am holy. And we believe we're sinful, which means we're going to find our lives out of alignment sometimes, a lot of times, with this perfectly holy God. And we find that that's the, the pricking of our conscience that we're going to start to feel. That's, and, and when I fail and when I sin and when I go against Scripture, then my conscience should scream at me. The lights on the dashboard of my life should be saying, warning, warning, your engine's about to blow up. Do not keep going. That's a gift. That is a kindness of God that leads us to repentance. See, and yet, yet, I can believe that at the same time. I can believe that what Scripture will tell me is that a guilty conscience is a barrier to fellowship with God. Isn't it? Like if I feel, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm unworthy and God, you must be so displeased with me and all this stuff because I just have this, this condemning conscience. I, 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 it's a barrier to my relationship with God. So what do I do? How do I handle that kind of thing? And the answer is the gospel. Do you understand, Christian, how incredible the news of the gospel is. Like, do you, do you understand that you can have, according to your Bible and according to what we say we believe, you can have a clean conscience. That doesn't have to walk around always feeling dirty and always feel muddied. We, there is no other religion in the world I can say that unequivocally. There is not one that offers you forgiveness of sins and cleansing of your consciousness. Not one. But listen to Scripture right now. 
Listen to David in Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Okay, so it starts off with this general principle. Oh God, what a blessing it is to know that I'm forgiven. But then look what he does. Now he's going to talk about his conscience. And guilt, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. And then it has that word, selah. Most scholars believe that means just stop right there and just meditate on what you just read. How many of you walk around with a guilty conscience? How many of you Walk around unwilling to deal with what David is dealing with here, the conviction of sin. He says, I kept quiet. I kept quiet. My bones wasted away. Ever felt like that? What a graphic description of what it feels like to wrestle in your conscience over sin. And then he goes, I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave it. What an unbelievable thing. John's going to go on in 1 John and say, if we say we have no sins, we deceive ourselves. Nobody can say they're not a sinner. And the truth is, if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. There it is again. I'm going to cleanse you. And the writer of Hebrews is going to take all that Old Testament stuff and say, man, the blood of bulls and goats in Hebrews chapter 9, 13, he says, the blood of bulls and goats couldn't get rid. All it could do is purify the flesh so that I could walk in ritually clean into the temple. How much more, look what he says in in Hebrews 9.15, how much more the blood of Christ, it'll purify our consciences from dead works to serve the living God. How many people walk around feeling guilty over past sins? Some of you grew up in homes where your sins were constantly confronted, the past sins of your life, you know, you, what about this? What about you? So now as an adult, you walk around and you have this constant, low-grade feeling of guilt for your past. A past that Jesus has forgiven. A past that you've walked away from. You may look back on your teenage years, you know, whatever, and like look back and go, oh my goodness, the stupid things I did. Teenagers, you'll say that about yourself someday, I promise. <laughs> The crazy things I thought, the gossip, the slander, the sexual sin. Some of you have abortion in your past. Some some of you have have some sort of racist ideology perhaps in your past. And we could go on and on and on and on. And some of you walk around feeling like, oh, I don't think I could ever be forgiven. These things just feel like a mountain. Where's the hope for somebody like that? The gospel. The gospel that says, look, God gave his son to cover, to forgive, to wipe the slate clean, never to count those sins against you, throws them into the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed your transgressions from you, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, cleanse your conscience because it's laid on Jesus and he paid for them forever, never, ever to be brought up to you again. You see why we need the gospel? See, and yet, see if you resonate with this. Becoming a Christian didn't solve your guilty conscience problems. In fact, it might have supercharged them. Right? Because what do we believe, Christian? We actually believe that when I become a Christian, put my faith in Jesus and something absolutely miraculous takes place. The Spirit of God comes to dwell inside of me and begins to write the law of God on my heart. That's wonderful. But it also means now I may have a more guilty conscience. 
I may have even a hyper awareness of what's going on, right? Because the spirit now dwells me. And I'm saying that was a bad thing. I'm saying we live in fallen human flesh. This kind of, this sort of war happens, right? Sometimes our consciences as Christians get more condemning than they were before. The war gets more intense, right? In fact, I can say this, I think on the authority of scripture, that the longer you follow after God, the longer you grow with God, the more you know of God and the more you're going to see a gap between what you know to be true about God and your obedience to God. And this is why Isaiah is going to, here's a prophet of God who speaks for God, right? Thus says the Lord, and Isaiah is going to see God in all of his holiness and magnificence and say, woe is me, I am undone, I'm a man of unclean lips, I'm a sinful person. Paul, before he dies, is going to call himself the chief of sinners, Because I think this is one of the things that happens to us, right? We grow and we become more sensitive. Now, there's a good part of that, right? There can be a good part of that, but there can be an oversensitivity to feeling condemned by things you didn't do. And so what happens when we find ourselves in that place of being condemned? We go back again and again to the gospel. We confess our sin, we say, and then no, he's faithful and just. God, I know, there's, but, but there's things in my past that have been taken care of. That's over. And I'm now who you, as we sing, who you say I am. My sins are forgiven. I've been cleansed of that. I don't have to live under that weight anymore. Job doesn't have what we have. Okay, Job is an old covenant Christian, like so if we can say it this way, right? In other words, Job knows my Redeemer lives. Job knows innocent suffering. Boy, this is, I'm seeing through a, a glass dimly what may be coming, but I'm not sure I understand it. And yet, Job in his old covenant faith, he still says, I, I, I desperately, I want to approach God. But, but look, it, old covenant believers had this guilty conscience. There's nothing they could do to wipe it clean. The blood of bulls and goats and lambs and all that would not cleanse their conscience. They could not cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. We, but we, Christian, we live on this side of the cross. I, I want to remind you over and over again why that's so important, right? We now know there's a cross. We now know there's forgiveness. We now see it in all of its fullness. And we can approach the throne of grace in our time of need because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Job doesn't have that. And yet, Job held fast. And yet, Job said, I'm not going to deny my conscience. My conscience holds me captive. I will not walk around, friends, feeling guilt for something I've never done, as much as you heap it upon me. And listen, this is how we talk to our conscience. This is how we train We say, here's what I know to be true, and I'm going to rest right here. Because some of us have overly sensitive consciences, and some of us have insensitive. Because there's some of you that need to feel the weight of sin. And there's others of you that would say, all that sin is in my past, and I still walk around feeling the guilt of it. And this is where we have to have our conscience calibrated. I got to have it calibrated. I got to bring it back, right? Right? I don't, Job says, I will not deny what is true of me. I can't do that without denying God. And that's true for you, Christian. It is not humility. It is not humility for you to look and say, I am so unworthy and God must be so disappointed in me. And I just walk around like a worm all the time. You are a worm. You're a redeemed worm that God desperately loves, right? Right? He loves you and wants you to act like a child of God and wants you to know the victory that comes with that, wants you to know the joy that comes of following him. Not to simply say, you know what, I'm just, it is not humility, it's a lack, Job's gonna say, the Bible's gonna say, that's not humility, that's a lack of integrity. That's an issue of truthfulness. We must be truthful. Here's who I am. Christian, your conscience is a gift when it's properly calibrated and trained by Scripture. 
Job isn't oversensitive. Job isn't insensitive. He will not allow condemnation to enter in when there's no basis for it. And Christian, we must neither. We must neither. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, I just pray you would help us day after day, week after week, for our consciences to be trained and calibrated to Scripture. Lord, none of us has an infallible conscience. And so we must not always let our conscience be our guide, but we must also not go to the other extreme and say, it'll never be my guide. Thank you for the gift. And thank you because even now, God, you're reminding us of things. You're reminding us of past sins that are dealt with and gone and we don't have to walk around under the weight of. For some of us, that's what we need to hear. For others, Lord, we we need to hear that, hey, your conscience is, is, the lights are flashing. Listen, today would be a day, God, there would be people who would be awakened to the truth of Jesus would look and say, man, I I came in here perhaps feeling guilty, feeling unforgiven. Lord, I pray they would hear the hope. They could walk out of here, new creations. They could walk out of here knowing they are forgiven. They could walk out of here with consciences cleaned because it's not some, some sacrifice of an animal. It's not some ritual. It's because of what Jesus Christ, what you did once for all. Father, may today be a day where people turn and say, I want nothing more to do with that sin. And I see what Jesus Christ did in shedding his blood and it can cleanse my conscience. Oh, I've longed for that. That today would be a day where as they put their faith in Jesus, they would know that for those of us, God, in this room, that even though we've had, we know this is the truth. Lord, help us to walk in this. To walk away from guilt where guilt is not based on a present sin that we're walking through, but Lord, it's based on something that we know is in the past and been forgiven. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for it and we ask this in your name.